Thank you, Dr. Silver, uh, for the introduction and the opportunity to be together here with uh, all of you, colleagues, uh, scientists, and clinicians. It's uh, really a wonderful event and very meaningful for us to be here again in 2017 in New York. So my task was to discuss biomarkers and molecular abnormalities. What do they mean for uh, clinical practice and for patients? Um, it's always difficult to follow Dr. Spivak because he has covered a, a lot. Uh, my role here is to translate a little bit more <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, try to live up to his uh, great example. So my objectives are to review molecular underpinnings and to review biologic factors that influence disease manifestations and outcomes. And that's what we call a biomarker, something that relates the activity of a disease uh, either in its diagnosis or outcome. And I always like to go back in time uh, because we have to know where we've come from and uh, to where uh, how we got here. And it helps us anticipate the future and let our imaginations really expand because we are only limited in our imagination of, of what's going to come to be. Uh, what we have here, oh good, I have a marker. <laughs> Two things here. Uh, so um, uh, this is uh, the first hundred years of MPN, or really just the last century. And uh, myeloid proliferative neoplasms have been described uh, since the middle of the 19th century. But in the early 20th century, we had William Mosler, the first chief of medicine at Johns Hopkins, my institution, who was not the first to describe polycythemia vera, but he was the first to uh, describe it in English and to uh, relate it in his first textbook of medicine. And he coined the phrase polycythemia vera. So this is really the beginning of the English language and the, the acknowledgement, a recognition of this entity. So 1903. There was a hundred years from that original English language description and description in textbooks and coining of the entity to uh, the five uh, papers. This is the French uh, paper that uh, identified the clonal JAK2 mutation that uh, seemed to be very closely related to polycythemia vera and uh, ultimately causal, as we recognize. So a hundred years from early description to molecular underpinning, huge discovery. Um, this also is in, in line with genetic discovery in general. So uh, Bovary here, this is the first to describe the term gene, the packet of genetic information uh, around uh, at the turn of the century, around the time Osler was describing P. Vera. By the middle of the century, we have the discovery of DNA, and this is Rosalind Franklin's uh, X-ray crystallography of the DNA structure. And then finally, uh, uh, in 2001, the human genome reported in Nature the full resequencing of our genome. So our disease, polycythemia vera, uh, really in the same time span went from clinical description to genetic underpinning, along with the whole idea of genes and now uh, resequencing of our human genome. So these go hand in hand, and certainly one informs the other. Uh, today we have to talk about science and, and our belief in the power of science and the power of knowledge, and particularly in light of yesterday's events in uh, 2011. Uh, we are only ever going to come to understanding uh, with uh, more knowledge, and knowledge is power. And what this is a graph of uh, from 1955 until 2015 is if you search the natural, uh, National Library of Medicine and you put in myeloproliferative uh, disease, this is the number of papers on the y-axis. And you can see just the huge uptick in papers uh, describing myeloproliferative disease, genetics, uh, treatment, natural history. And so you see, we are all happily in this era of a huge upswing in understanding, and it's only going to inform how we treat and uh, cure these diseases. It's hard for all of us, patients and physicians, to keep up with this knowledge, but it's also a wonderful blessing and a great time to to be involved. So I want to go back to 2005 because this is a, you know, a, my task was biomarkers and molecular underpinnings. Dr. Spivak gave a great overview. I just want to reinforce in a much uh, more uh, basic um, or cartoonish uh, um, a presentation. So 2005 was the discovery of this acquired somatic mutation of the JAK2 gene. 
Acquired meaning you acquired it during your lifetime in a stem cell. You were not born with the JAK2 mutation. Somatic, because it's not in a germline cell, meaning a sperm or a, over a, a egg. It's in a uh, somatic cell that uh, has stem cell-like properties. And uh, we already know about the JAK2 gene. Uh, the normal function of the JAK2 gene is to help translate a signal uh, that a hormone, in here in purple, binds to a receptor, and then the receptor becomes activated, but it has to transmit a signal, and inside the cell is JAK2 associated with that receptor, to then translate a signal through its kinase activity of growth. Growth or uh, survival for the cell, it turns on a lot of different pathways. This just shows the, uh, one of the pathways, the JAK-STAT pathway, goes on to the cell, turning on genes so that the cell can then do things, grow, differentiate, become a red cell, white cell, or platelet. The acquired somatic mutation of JAK2 enhances this normal activity. So I use an analogy to patients. It's like turning an idol up on the car. It just uh, it uh, still functions normally with the mutation, but it sends a little bit more of a signal than it should. And it's estimated about 1% to 5% more of a signal with the mutation than without it. So not much of an increase in signaling on a day-to-day -day basis, but like your mortgage points <laughs> over 5 or 10 or 20 years, it ends up to a lot of extra uh, interest. Um, so the, the mutation is enhances the kinase activity, and this activating lesion in, uh, enables a cell to live longer, to outperform other cells that don't have the mutation. These activating lesions never spontaneously resolve. Once the mistake is made in the genetic code, when that cell divides, the daughter cells have that mistake also in them. So it's like photocopying an error every time the cell divides, uh, it's not corrected. And the activating mutations never spontaneously resolve. Um, it enhance, allows the cell to expand. And this cell that has the JAK2 mutation can live longer or outperform cells that don't. And then, as Dr. Spivak mentioned, the JAK2 mutation uh, very uniquely has this ability to make two copies in a cell. So, right, we're term, uh, familiar with the term heterozygous, meaning one copy of a cell or a carrier state of a, of a gene. Uh, for some reason, the JAK2 mutation, you acquired it on one copy, and then the other uh, allele in a cell can develop the same mutation, so you get a double dose. And this is quite unique to JAK2, and uh, a lot of things uh, are related to gene dosage uh, with how many mutations you have that inform the allele burden, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So uh, after the discovery in t uh, 2005, the first diseases that really uh, were looked at was polycythemia vera. It was clear that most patients with the clinical entity of P. vera had the JAK2V617F mutation. But then uh, other uh, groups also looking at ET and myelofibrosis uh, also found the exact same mutation. So what I have here is a Venn diagram, and in this uh, large uh, circle uh, uh, with a uh, heavy black rim is if you could collect all the individuals who have JAK2 V617F. And then uh, the subcircles are all the individuals with the particular entities. So you can see the most of the people with JAK2 V617F in this large, uh, thick circle have polycythemia vera. If you look uh, at uh, some of these others, they have ET. But you can see ET, there's a lot of individuals who don't have the JAK2 mutation who fall outside of the circle. And then similarly to ET, myelofibrosis, about half of individuals will have myelofibrosis and ha will have the JAK2 mutation and half won't. There's also an a, a entity called refractory anemia with ring sideroblasts and thrombocytosis also has the JAK2 V617F mutation. So right, we have a lot of overlapping circles here and what accounts for this variation? Despite the same nucleotide change, the JAK2 V617F, we have these three entities the circles overlap because we often uh, see patients who can have ET who seem to move into a PV or uh, move over to myelofibrosis over time. So we know there's a lot of modifiers. We know that the JAK2 gene dosage maybe determines what uh, circle uh, a person may manifest. 
And we know now that age, gender, strangely, and time also influence how um, the disease manifests despite the same mutation. 2013, this was the discovery of the acquired somatic mutation of CalR. Um, uh, CalR accounts for about 20% of individuals who uh, do not have the JAK2 mutation. Um, uh, Dr. Spivak discussed that the CalR mutation uh, actually activates the same signaling pathway that the JAK2 mutation does, um, although in a very different uh, process. CalR also, uh, since it activates the JAK2 signaling pathway, again, it allows the cell to expand and uh, to have an advantage over other stem cells so that you get a lot of uh, clonal expansion of uh, cells that have the CalR mutation. Um, uh, in contrast to JAK2, gene dosage is not such a factor in CalR. So as I mentioned, the JAK2 mutation, you can get two copies in one cell. This does not happen as uh, frequently in the CalR mutation. So the gene dosage does not seem to be as much of an issue. But despite that, in the CalR Venn diagram, so again, if we could imagine in this dark circle here, all the individuals who have the CalR mutation, what is their disease? We see about half of those individuals have high platelets, ET, and half have myelofibrosis. I put PV way off to the side because there are a few individuals who have CalR mutation who seem to have polycythemia vera, but I think that's a pretty small uh, fraction of the group. Um, uh, like JAK2, though, time and age seem to influence uh, what kind of disease you have with the CalR mutation. So a, a great question that Jerry uh, touched. Oops. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. What did I do? Yeah. Uh-oh. No, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> okay. You think I'm... I... Oh, okay. Wait. Okay. I won't. I won't touch that again. <laughs> okay. So where do where do mutations come from? Why did why do we get these things? And this is an important question. Um, uh, and uh, this has been informed by uh, the sequencing of large populations. Um, meaning that, so uh, studies where you have th hundreds of thousands of individuals who say donated a DNA sample to perhaps look at cardiovascular or genetic risks. Uh, in investigators were able to go back into those huge repositories of DNA from the population and just ask questions. Well, how many mutations are in the blood cells of individuals uh, in the country? And we can either look for a particular uh, mutation like JAK2V617F or uh, sequence all uh, genes of, of relevance. And so you generate information like this. So on this axis is the age at the time of the uh, exam. Uh, so from here, 20 to 29 versus uh, individuals 100 to 108 who participate in these large repository studies. And then this is the frequency of uh, mutations. And in this study uh, published in the New England Journal just a couple years ago now, uh, they looked, I think, at a number, uh, at least this is a report of about five different mutations, including JAK2, V617F, and their prevalence in the normal population. Again, these aren't patients with blood diseases. They were just individuals who participated in large resequencing studies, so normal population. And we can see as uh, population ages, we start to see an uh, increase in mutations. Um, among persons greater than 60 years, uh, you can see that the frequency of mutation starts to really rise. So again, aging itself is a huge risk factor. And then in this group, men had an increased likelihood of having detectable mutation as compared with women. So about 30% more. So again, male sex seems to be important in terms of the mutation rate. So again, age and gender effects influence just why we get mutations in the first place.
And now uh, more on where do mutations come from, looking more specifically at jak 2 v 617 f This is from a review we uh, recently published. And uh, the focus of this review was about age and gender influence on JAK2 positive uh, uh, mutations. And uh, in the audience today, we have Dr. Jason Gottlieb, who published this study. This was a huge collaborative study with the group 23andMe um, uh, here. 23andMe collected uh, 252,000 individuals who submitted saliva samples for DNA testing, you know, where you can look at heredity. And they went back and they genotyped all those samples to look for the JAK2 V617F. Again, these are just 250,000 individuals without blood disorders, mostly. And what they found was uh, here, over time, uh, it, uh, based on age, the mutation rate, very low at, at the age of 1 through 30, but by the uh, 61 through 112, you actually uh, did find a, a substantial uh, number of individuals in this normal population that had the JAK2 mutation. So that overall it was 0.2% of the 250,000, but that distribution increased with age. This was uh, published in the 23andMe study, and then a Danish Copenhagen study did really a very similar study many years before, where they looked at 10,000 individuals, again, from a normal population, not blood disorders, and they found a fairly similar rate of 0.17% uh, of individuals had the JAK2 V617F. And when they looked at who they were, it was uh, definitely skewed for uh, aging. So JAK2 V617F is the fifth most common lesion of aging uh, and uh, uh, has been replicated in many studies across the world now. But very important is this, that females were much less common in males to be carriers or to have this low level of JAK2 in the general population. So if you look here at the female percentage between these two general population studies, 41% versus 28%. So again, a male predominance in getting these uh, lesions with aging. But then when we compared here on the right, the 23andMe uh, group also specifically recruited MPN patients. And many of you might have submitted, uh, participated in this uh, study. They looked specifically for MPN patients and uh, did 726 diagnosed MPN patients. Uh, and when they looked at the JAK2 positive group there, so 100% of those uh, 726 had the mutation, now they found that 69% of the disease-associated JAK2 were females. So again, this disconnect between women being more at risk for actually getting the full-blown disease or more prevalent, whereas males having a higher mutation rate with aging. So there's a lot of biologic factors that determine why we get this, how we get it, and how it manifests. So important question, does the type of driver mutation matter? So what does it mean to us? And uh, well, it's very important to know whether you have JAK2 V617F, uh, CAL or MPL, because really the different entities subtend uh, vastly different frequencies. So again, if you have polycythemia vera, 99%, uh, you'll have the V617F or the much less common JAK2 exon 12. We know that if you have a high platelets, you can have any of the three entities, uh, JAK2, CALR, or MPL mutations, and similar for primary myelofibrosis. So it helps us diagnostically, but it's also important uh, to compare JAK2 V6N7F versus CALR. We know that this is the most common, uh, so 75% of all MPM patients will have V6N7F, whereas CALR tracks more with just ET and MF. We know that JAK2 V617F tends to uh, be compatible with older age at presentation, so 50 or above, whereas CalR, we have many patients who are diagnosed in their teens and 20s uh, with CalR, so much more common to be diagnosed younger. We, we understand that ET transformation to PV or evolution is very common in V617F, whereas this is very uncommon in JAK2. We understand that thrombosis rates are higher uh, in JAK2 V617F and include arterial and venous events. So again, when we try to risk stratify patients, it's very important now to understand what their driver lesion is because it helps us uh, determine their risk. Whereas CalR, um, thrombosis rates may be lower, but they tend to be microvascular and, and transient ischemic attacks. 
Uh, we understand with CAR, you can have real extreme thrombocytosis. So platelet counts in two or three million um, compared to the thrombocytosis we see with V617F. And then transformation rates to myelofibrosis, AML, seem to be on the order of uh, median to 10 years in uh, the uh, few patients who will do that with JAK2, whereas there is much longer latency in individuals with CALR mutations. So again, huge differences in biology. So it's very important to recognize this when we're evaluating patients. We understand that females are more common than males when having ET in general, and that's a, a mystery that we're still trying to understand. And we understand that males are more common than females in presenting with myelofibrosis. So again, a huge difference that gender uh, plays in the biology. So well, we also now have, uh, does the amount of mutations matter? And uh, when the JAK2 discovery occurred, it was quickly realized that some individuals had more JAK2 than others when we tested in their blood or bone marrows. And how can that be? How can you have more than a mutation? I think Jerry Spivak showed us pretty well how we can have more based on the number of clones involved and whether they have one copy or two. Now, when we do sequencing or the clinical testing, this is a copy of our laboratory's report. So here you can see that uh, the gene JAK2 and V617F is indicated there. And then over here we have this VAF, or variant allele fraction. And that's uh, what we call the allele burden. You'll hear this now. And I, I know, do you have to be your own scientist? Well, I, I think we all do. We have to understand the variant allele fraction now tells us what percentage of, of the JAK2 genes in a blood sample have the mutation. And you can see the variant allele fraction in this patient with high platelets was 5%. So that means 5% of the JAK2 genes had the V617F mutation. And so, like Dr. Spivak said, it's not enough to know whether you have it or not, meaning categorically yes or no, do you have the mutation? But it's also important how much of it you have, right? Because that really uh, tells us a lot. Um, in contrast, here's a different patient of mine who, again, we sent this uh, mutation panel testing. Again, the JAK2 mutation, but now the variant allele fraction, 75%. And this patient has polycythemia vera. So it does help us uh, broadly classify patients and inform us quite a bit. And again, just to uh, bring this uh, home again, if, if we can imagine uh, each one of these uh, Circles is a stem cell that operates in a person's bone marrow, and white means normal. <laughs> There's no JAK2 mutations. If we did a variant allele fraction or allele burden for the JAK2 mutation across this uh, sample here on the top, it would be zero, right? No mutations. Down here on the red, red means two copies of the JAK2 mutation for each cell. So if we measured a variant allele fraction in this patient's uh, stem cell pool, it would be 100%, right? So you can have zero or 100%. But we have also now found that, well, individuals can have a whole mosaic at any time in their uh, bone marrow stem cells. So you can have normal stem cells, you can have a single copy in blue, a heterozygous stem cell with a mutation, homozygous stem cell, and a whole variety of assortments so that when we do a variant, a, a variant allele fraction of different uh, uh, patients, you can see a, a huge range in the y-axis here is the variant allele fraction, and here we have ET patients, PV patients, post-PV MF, uh, post, I'm sorry, post ETMF and post PVMF. And you can see that, again, there's a huge distribution of patients uh, of the variant allele fraction by uh, disease, but they definitely, uh, as the allele burden increases, um, the disease uh, classification changes. So that's been hugely informative to us to understand what's going on in an individual and the explanation of why you can get this uh, variation. And then finally, do the number and types of mutations matter? We've talked about the variant allele fraction is important for understanding how the burden of the disease, but then additional mutations, this is something that we're really learning in the last few years, and now we have the capacity to get this information clinically, is very important. So this is a patient uh, a few years ago who had just the JAK2 mutation, and as uh, their disease started to transform to a different entity, 
we found that a number of additional mutations in different genes uh, came up in addition to having the JAK2 mutation. So this is very important for us. It's terrifying knowledge sometimes to understand how much things are changing in an individual, but it is still knowledge that we need to use in order to care for uh, ourselves better. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh no. What did I do? No. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing the screen here. Why didn't I just push the forward button? <laughs> The screen is no longer um, showing me anything. Oh, there we go. What? You do have the magic touch. <laughs> we all knew it. Okay, maybe I should do this. Mm. Okay. Dr. Silver. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's not responding to this yet. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I, I just have a few more minutes. Uh, so I, I just want to uh, touch on again what, what some studies uh, Dr. Vrashtovic here and colleagues at uh, MD Anderson uh, showed us do the number and types of mutations matter? So we, we talked about, gee, do, do they matter in terms of what's going on with the patient and the natural history of their disease? And they now seem to matter very much as how patients are going to respond to therapy. So this was a study looking at uh, the role of Pegasus uh, in uh, uh, ET and uh, PV patients. And they showed, uh, uh, they looked back in the responders, so the complete molecular response versus partial versus uh, no response. And again, uh, they showed the JAK2 allele burden here uh, uh, before the study. And then uh, while at, at complete molecular response, we saw marked reductions in the JAK2 allele burden. So again, the Pegasus seemed to be really clearing out a lot of the stem cells uh, or suppressing them. And that there were not additional mutations uh, in these patients. Uh, compared to the patients who didn't respond or only had partial responses, their JAK2 allele percentages did not really come down over time. And they also acquired a number of other uh, mutations in genes or had them from the start. So again, the types of mutations and how many and, and what class they are, are are really quite important to both diagnosis and also as we move forward, probably in terms of how we're going to respond to therapy. So uh, I want to finish up. Um, I just had a few compare and contrasts. But uh, I'm going to have to move on, and I think others uh, in this uh, meeting will cover some of the other meanings of the biomarkers. But the genetic of MPN informs the disease uh, class and age and gender are uh, certainly huge biomarkers. JAK2, uh, CalR, and MPL subtend unique uh, disease classes, and the amount of these mutations and additional uh, genetic mutations are very important. These are diseases where the history is measured in decades, and disease duration is an important modifier of the acquisition of, of, of more mutations. And as Dr. Spivak said, and I think we all believe this, yes, you can draw survival curves for the different diseases, myelofibrosis, uh, PVAR, and ET, but every individual has their own survival curve, and we have to hold to that, right? We don't follow these. Um, and I think I'm just going to end um, by thanking the organizers here. I really appreciate being here today and sharing this information with you. I also want to invite you to uh, Johns Hopkins. We still have William Mosler's uh, original office where he wrote the textbook about P. Vera. And we have our new hospital that opened a few years ago um, to reflect the new age. Thank you. Thank you.